Okay, I've now finished with everything I wrote about the topic, which was perfectly accurate. No one has ever found one minor error even. There have been lies, like what you just heard, but no errors. Among the many things said by those who have studied intellectuals, a comment by Professor Mark Lilla of Columbia University in his book The Reckless Mind is especially striking. Distinguished professors, gifted poets, and influential journalists summoned their talents to convince all who would listen that modern tyrants were liberators and that their unconscionable crimes were noble when seen in the proper perspective. Your conversion to realizing that Paul Pot uh, was a mass murderer, and you, you've finally seen the light on that, have you, Mr. Chomsky? No, I've seen exactly the light that I saw at the beginning. There's been a vast amount of lying on this topic, including an article which happens to be right before me in today's Daily Camera. Which I wrote. Which you wrote. Well, let me describe to you the... Okay. Uh, then, fine, then let me... Okay. There's no time here. You know, it takes a phrase to produce a lie and ten minutes to decode it, so I'll just take one, the one you've just mentioned. Uh, let's take the Pol Pot atrocities, okay? Uh, you say here somewhere that everybody knows that Pol Pot killed two million people or some phrase to that extent, to like that. Okay, let's look at that two million people and what I wrote about it. He killed no one according to you, right? In this Pardon? book here. In this book by you, you say he killed yes. virtually no one. after the cataclysm. Yeah. And you can look and check exactly what I'm saying. You said it was a well orchestrated his, uh, campaign yes. of hysteria. And I, may I finish yes. on the two million? Okay. Intellectuals, in the restricted sense which largely conforms to general usage, are ultimately unaccountable to the external world. The prevalence and presumed desirability of this are confirmed by such things as academic tenure and expansive concepts of academic freedom and academic self-governance. In the media, expansive notions of freedom of speech and of the press play similar roles. In short, unaccountability to the external world is not simply a happenstance, but a principle. John Stuart Mill argued that intellectuals should be free even from social standards, while setting social standards for others. Not only have intellectuals been insulated from material consequences, they have often enjoyed immunity from even a loss of reputation after having been demonstrably wrong. As Eric Hoffer put it, one of the surprising privileges of intellectuals is that they are free to be scandalously asinine without harming their reputation. January 1977, it was immediately reviewed in the New York Review of Books, translating an article, a review that just appeared in France. Did you kind of uh, come to the point? Uh, I'll get to the point. I'll long. get to the point. The review and all I that. told you it takes ten minutes to decode a lie, and I'm now decoding it, okay? Uh, this, uh, in this review, Jean Lacouture stated that according to Ponchot, Pol Pot had killed, in fact, boast, he didn't talk about Pol Pot because nobody knew him then, uh, he said the Khmer Rouge have boasted, that was his word, of killing two million people. That's where the figure of two million comes from that you've heard over and over again since. Well, I was interested. I hadn't seen figures like that. So, and the book was not available in the United States. Incidentally, La Couture's review was immediately picked up by the press, quoted all over the place. Oh, isn't this fantastic? I'm horrifying. Uh, they've killed two million people. Uh, incidentally, in July 1975, two years earlier, the New York Times had already accused them of genocide. Uh, but now we had support from Panchot, the French priest, high source, says they killed two million people. Well, I had no opinion on it one way or another. So I did the obvious thing. I wrote to some friends in France and asked them to mail me the book, because no copy of it existed in the United States. It was being quoted all over the place. Everybody was quoting it, but it didn't exist. So I got a copy of the French book. And here's what I discovered. Here's the source of your two million figures. Uh, I discovered that according to Ponchot, the United States was responsible for the death of 800,000 Cambodians in the bombing uh, in the war in the first half of the decade. And then he says, according to the American embassy, the Pol Pot regime is responsible for 1.2 million deaths from all causes, including killing, starvation, overwork, etc. All right, La Couture read that. He added up the two figures, the alleged claim of the American embassy and Ponchot's claim about the American war, added them up, comes to two million, attributed it all to Pol Pot. That was the two million figure. Well, I did the next obvious thing. I wrote a personal letter to La Couture uh, in which I said, look, I don't know what's going on in Cambodia, 
but you misquoted Poncho. Uh, I gave a series of misquotes. It turns out that every reference of his to the book was may a I total for a moment? May I continue? We have some Cambodians may I here continue? in Boulder. I will con just a second. You asked, me to, you asked me to talk about your particular lie. I will now talk about it, okay? If you wanted me to talk about other lies, I'll talk about them. Uh, this, if, if, you'll bear with me, if you'll bear with me on this, it's a very illuminating story about the way a system of indoctrination works and about the way commissars work. Let's continue. Uh, uh, so so and may I continue? Let's go and May I continue? You, you don't want me to, you don't want to, it's plain that you don't want to hear this, and I understand why, but let me continue anyway. Okay, I've now finished with everything I wrote about the topic, which was perfectly accurate. No one has ever found one minor error, even. There have been lies, like what you just heard, but no errors. I will tell you, because this is important, that's why. That's why. Let me, do you want to, do, do you, do you, do you want to know the answer to this question or don't you? You don't, okay. Well, all right, let me just ask for a show of hands. How many people want me to give you this answer? Okay, then uh, final remark. What is, what is his, what is his, do, do you want to hear what the scholarly record shows? Yes, okay. What the, what his estimate, his estimate, excuse me, his estimate is that the total number who died above what would be expected if you had had regular population growth is about 700,000. There's another study by the one government that carried out an official inquiry into this, the government of Finland, uh, uh, of course, again, never mentioned in the United States, they come out with somewhat lower estimates. The State Department Journal Problems of Communism came out with a still lower estimate. Uh, the leading, there are people, incidentally, who are apologists for Pol Pot. Uh, the government scholar Douglas Pike, who now heads the Indochina Resource Center, according to him, Pol Pot was, I'm quoting, the charismatic leader of a peasant revolution under whom the population didn't suffer anywhere near as much as they said. However, I haven't said any of these things. I've just reported the facts. Now, why does that bother people so much? Because what Herman and I did was, uh, our, was we took the position that it is not proper to lie either in suppressing the crimes of your own state or exaggerating the crimes of an official enemy. And of course, the commissars who insist on the right to lie are outraged by this. Do you want to go on to the next lie, this one having been discussed? The intellectuals who idolized Stalin while he was purging millions and stifling the least stirring of freedom have not been discredited. They are still holding forth on every topic under the sun and are listened to with deference. Sartre returned in 1939 from Germany, where he studied philosophy, and told the world that there was little to choose between Hitler's Germany and France. Yet Sartre went on to become an intellectual pope, revered by the educated in every land. In short, constraints which apply to people in most other fields do not apply even approximately equally to intellectuals. It would be surprising if this did not lead to different behavior. Among those differences are the ways they see the world, and the way they see themselves in relation to their fellow human beings and the societies in which they live. There are many serious implications of this, which may, among other things, help explain why so many leading intellectuals have so often backed notions that prove to be disastrous. It is not simply with particular policies at particular times that intellectuals have often advocated mistaken and dangerous decisions. Their whole general approach to policymaking, their ideology, has often reflected a crucial misconception about knowledge and its concentration or dispersion. Many intellectuals and their followers have been unduly impressed by the fact that highly educated elites, like themselves, have far more knowledge per capita, in the sense of special knowledge, than does the population at large. From this, it is a short step to considering the educated elites to be superior guides to what should and should not be done in a society. They have often overlooked the crucial fact that the population at large may have vastly more total knowledge, in the mundane sense, than the elites, even if that knowledge is scattered in individually unimpressive fragments among vast numbers of people.
would like to I'd like to thank uh, President Chavez for the kind and generous words. Quisiera agradecerle al presidente Chavez sus amables y generosas palabras de bienvenida. He said that I write about peace and criticize the barriers to peace. That's easy. Eh, hablar de la paz y criticar a aquellos que están en contra de la paz de alguna manera es fácil. Lo difícil es crear un nuevo mundo, un mundo diferente. Fácil es hablar de eso. And what's so exciting about uh, at last visiting Venezuela, I can see how a better world is being created and can speak to the person who's inspired it. Lo emocionante en este caso es ver en Venezuela cómo se está construyendo ese otro mundo posible y ver a uno de los hombres que ha inspirado esa situación. So thank you very much. <laughs> Muchas gracias.